Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Curtis, please take a seat. <laughs> um, as an outcome, as we mentioned, for this uh, conference, uh, we do have rapporteurs here and we will be generating a report. Uh, in the final session today, there'll be a summary and wrap up. Uh, and we want to hear uh, some of the thoughts from the delegates during that session. So in preparation, these are the two questions that will be posed to the delegates. Uh, what should what should Australia do to enhance peace and security through the UN? And equally, what should the UNAA do to promote the UN's work in peace and security? So keep those two, uh, two questions in the back of your mind as you watch the rest of today, uh, and then you'll be asked to uh, um, uh, provide your thoughts on that uh, through uh, a microphone Q&A session uh, at the end of today. Thanks a lot. In 1948, the United Nations Truce Supervision Organization, UNSO, was created to observe and maintain a ceasefire, which marked the end of hostilities between Israel and the Arab League. It was the first UN peacekeeping operation in the world. Currently, there are some 16 peacekeeping missions scattered across the globe. More than ever before, women are signing up to serve as United Nations peacekeepers. In 2007, the first all-female battalion was dispatched to Liberia by the Indian government to assist this African nation in maintaining peace and security. Now their term has come to an end and they're preparing to return to India. After nine years of service, they'll be leaving a lasting legacy behind in Liberia to inspiring Liberian women, to encourage them to join those entities, those operations that protect the nation. For that we'll always be grateful. Following in their footsteps are the Mongolian female peacekeepers who were dispatched to South Sudan last year to help keep the peace and offer protection to women and girls displaced by the ongoing conflict. But the work was challenging for these brave women who found themselves thousands of miles away from home in a foreign land. Nevertheless, Lieutenant Erdine Ochir El Chinkerlo and her team continue to give medical assistance whenever needed, especially to women and children. I am a woman and I am a mother and I am a a peacekeeper's woman, and so I'm really proud of my peacekeeper's job. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Jonathan Curtis. I'm the uh, president of the United Nations Association here in Canberra, and uh, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to um, introduce our speakers this morning and to um, uh, MC this session. The title of the session, of course, is Preparing, Planning and Training for Future Challenges. Uh, the, what occurred to me from listening to several of the presentations this morning um, was, uh, was really two things. The, um, the first is that there's... Um, for peacekeeping to be effective, you need a very complex mix of capabilities, to, to uh, paraphrase Steve. There's complex systems involved. Uh, the other standout is that uh, what goes with that capability is that uh, it, conflicts are often unpredictable and when they start, you've got to be ready to go. Uh, so all of that takes time and uh, uh, training and preparation. We have um, this morning three speakers doc uh, in order, uh, Dr Jenny Whalen, uh, Leanne Smith and Jim Della Giacoma, is that the correct pronoun? Giacoma. Giacoma, my apologies. Uh, like Penny, I won't uh, run through uh, the detailed and distinguished biographies of the three since um, what we're most interested in he is hearing from the three, but um, uh, each do bring very briefly, 
uh, considerable experience in a range of academic and professional roles, and I very much look forward to hearing from them. The session this morning will have a very slightly different format in that we will have uh, three 10-minute uh, uh, presentations rather than the longer ones, which will give us um, greater scope uh, for conversation and discussion at the end. So to begin with, the, the three speakers will each speak from the lectern, uh, and then we'll, like uh, the previous one, we'll all move over to there. So uh, on that basis, uh, let me uh, welcome uh, Jenny to the stage. Please join me in welcoming uh, Jenny. Well, thank you, Jonathan, and thanks to UNAA. This is a, a fantastic event. Our panel uh, is looking at, at future challenges in this larger session about peace operations. And when I was thinking about what I might say, um, I was also mindful that we've just heard from um, some of the UN's most experienced senior leaders, uh, those who've been directly engaged in, at the highest levels in the practice of peace operations, and indeed in, at the strategic levels um, in New York. And my, my co-panelists who follow uh, uh, have a, a similar uh, deep engagement in the practice. Leanne um, in the field and at UN headquarters, uh, Jim in just about every role you can imagine. So as, a, as primarily a, a researcher, um, an analyst of this, I was thinking what it is that I can bring to this panel. And I guess what I, what I want to use my remarks to do is to frame the way we might think about challenges and how peacekeepers, how peacekeeping overcomes them. And I want to start by uh, looking briefly to the history of peace operations to highlight when we've seen some of the biggest challenges to UN peace operations in the past how the enterprise of UN peacekeeping has overcome them and what this might tell us about the future potential of peace operations and the UN to grapple with the very many complex challenges on the horizon. So if we take that long view of peacekeeping, what we see over seven decades now are repeated crises of confidence in the legitimacy and effectiveness of this constantly evolving, inventive but always compromised instrument of international peace and security. So if that first characteristic of UN peacekeeping's, his, peacekeeping's history is uh, crisis and questioning, the second, I think, is innovation. To me, innovation is peacekeeping's defining characteristic, and indeed, peacekeeping is the UN's most significant innovation. Finding no direct endorsement in the UN Charter and with a pretty checkered record of effectiveness, UN peacekeeping has had to continuously innovate in order to build and rebuild trust and confidence in its appropriateness and efficacy in the world. And so let me give you two examples of that crisis in innovation cycle from the past before turning briefly to today. The 1956 Suez crisis, as we heard a bit yesterday, uh, confronted the UN with circumstances that were unforeseen by the drafters of the Charter. And under these conditions, um, Lester Pearson, Doug Hammarskjöld, uh, among others, invent peacekeeping. Um, the deployment of forces with the consent of both parties of the conflict, who would be geopolitically neutral and thus impartial with re respect to the hostilities on the ground, and who for these reasons would not need to use force. And that UN emergency force was, direct, was a direct and urgent response to the conditions of the moment. Unlike all of the peacekeeping operations that follow, um, it had little guidance from the UN's previous experience of peace operations, of monitoring and, and the other very early operations. But nor was it hamstrung by previous templates, uh, normative prescriptions or existing mindsets about what peacekeeping is and how to do it. But that innovation immediately prompted, you might not know about this, immediately prompted a legitimacy crisis which led to perhaps the most significant threat to the UN and its viability in its first two decades. Um, the crisis over who would pay for peacekeeping ground the organisation quite literally to a halt in the 64-65 session of the General Assembly. As one observer at the time put it, the financial crisis was in the most superficial sense a financial one. Basically, the dispute is over what the UN should do 
and not, not over what it should spend in doing it. It was about who had a say in what peace operations would do and the representative or unrepresentative structures of the UN in governing that question. My second example of that crisis and innovation cycle is the early 1990s, which brought a rapid wave of dramatic innovation to UN peace operations as they de deployed um, much more so into civil wars charged with peace building, democratisation, uh, established to deal with humanitarian crises, much more often than wars between states or conflict between defined parties. And it's a period of reaction rather than careful design of scrambling to keep up with developments on the ground in places like Cambodia, El Salvador, Bosnia, Somalia, Rwanda. The different parts of UN peacekeeping during this period were, I think, really just reacting on the fly to circumstances that were fundamentally different to and profoundly more complex than those that had previously been encountered by the UN. And out of those years comes another deep legitimacy crisis for UN peacekeeping, as it's forced to confront failures including genocides, conflicts that flare rather than are resolved under the de deployment of peacekeepers, flawed elections, deep ethical dilemmas about humanitarian assistance that feeds rather than quells conflict and insecurity, and of course, genocides in Rwanda and, and Bosnia. But again, out of that crisis come new peacekeeping innovations. In particular, the identification of the protection of civilians as the defining purpose of UN peace operations, the endorsement of more robustness for operations to implement their mandates, and the professionalisation of peacekeeping in UN headquarters around its policy making. So if we follow this crisis of this cycle of crisis and innovation, what might we make of UN peace operations today? What are the crises currently brewing and how can the UN and for our purposes, particularly broader supporters of UN peacekeeping, prepare for them? I want to highlight three uh, challenges as I see them and then conclude briefly with three ideas for uh, preparing for the future. The first challenge, I think, uh, um, is the reality of big UN peace operations deployed for a long time that aren't having transformative change in their environment in places like the DRC. The second challenge, and uh, Patrick touched on this briefly earlier, is when Peace operations abut and begin to slide into counter-terrorism uh, in places like Mali and Somalia. And then the third challenge um, is what we might politely call the unintended consequences of UN peace operations or uh, more brutally and perhaps honestly, the, uh, the intolerable immoral disgraces of sexual exploitation and abuse by peacekeepers, as well as things like the outbreak of cholera in Haiti. Uh, other harms done by peacekeepers that, that pose a grave challenge to the moral authority of missions, of peacekeeping more broadly, of the protection of civilians and human rights agendas, and indeed of the entire UN. Um, the issue of sexual exploitation and abuse is, uh, is getting a lot of attention in New York at the moment. Um, the last few Secretary General's reports on the issue have been much more substantive and forward-looking than previous ones. We've seen the appointment of a special coordinator on the issue to improve UN efforts to address sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, we've just had announced a victim's rights advocate. Next week, the Secretary General uh, hosts a, well, next week in two days, um, hosts a high-level meeting on sexual exploitation and abuse in peacekeeping. Um, but this is an issue, despite all of these areas of reforms, this is an issue that continues to plague support for and the reputation of peacekeeping, which has a direct effect on the willingness of member states, including Australia, um, to contribute to it. This is, a, this is a real problem for the moral authority of the UN, and that's in large part why we've seen so much activity on it in New York. So what does the UN, including its member states like Australia, need to do to prepare for these challenges? Uh, three brief points, and, and we can come back to them in question or discussion. The first is to take accountability seriously. Um, 
not just on issues like sexual exploitation and abuse, though clearly much more is needed there, um, but on reforms like much, much stronger whistleblower protections, uh, independent monitoring and review of, of peace operations and peacekeeping on the ground, including the performance um, of, uh, of, of peacekeepers. And in addition to those, the UN has to find a way to put the experience of people in host societies at the centre of its policy design. UN policymaking must find fundamentally different ways to be people-centric, to genuinely see peacekeeping from below and to design peacekeeping by beginning with the experience of it, not by starting with bureaucratic turf wars and the path-dependent architectures of UN headquarters. The second idea is that the UN, and in particular members of the Security Council, must face up to the ineffectiveness of big one-sided peacekeeping that, uh, that backs a winner in a conflict, usually the state, um, and they instead must start reorienting peace interventions towards political settlements and inclusive mediation that talks to all sides. Third and finally, we need to maintain a nimble and flexible concept of peacekeeping. Peace operations have to be continually designed and redesigned according to their particular circumstances, not according to concrete principles or doctrine. This is how peace operations move beyond templates and take politics seriously. So we need to maintain the space for peacekeeping to evolve and to innovate, and that's very difficult in an environment of big, slow-moving bureaucracy averse to risk and where failure can have such profoundly devastating consequences. Um, nevertheless, they are the conditions that face UN peace operations and they're some of the big challenges um, that all, mem all parts of the UN, including advocates and, and friends of UN peacekeepers, need to grapple with. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I'd now welcome uh, Leanne Smith to the stage. Uh, Leanne, of course, is uh, Associate Director at the Whitlam Institute and former Chief of Policy and Best Practices at the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations. Welcome, Leanne. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everyone at UNAA. A particular big thank you uh, to Mike Smith and also to Tim Ford. I think the combination of um, peacekeeping being the topic of this conference and the commemoration of the memorial just uh, brings together so many great people with so much experience around this very important topic in hopefully a way we can get a little more profile around back here in Australia. So thank you very much. I'm here uh, today in my personal capacity. Um, and uh, just to give you a bit of sense of what, what my experience with the UN has been, I started with the UN as a human rights officer in Afghanistan a long time ago. Um, I've worked with our mission in South Sudan, first as part of the, the mission planning effort, um, and then later as the chief of the JMAC, the Joint Mission Analysis Centre. Um, I've worked with our missions in Liberia, East Timor, um, Kosovo, Lebanon, um, those in particular, I think, particularly around issues of peacekeeping transition and how we should responsibly leave a space as, as much as we get into it. Um, so this is kind of what informs my, my field experience. And from headquarters, I've been um, leading the teams who backstop our colleagues on, in the field who are working on issues like protection of civilians, conflict-related sexual violence, women, peace and security um, more broadly. Um, child protection, HIV AIDS and our wonderful civil affairs officers who are the largest civilian component of our missions on the ground, as well as working on policy reform, uh, guidance development and lessons learning. So there will be a lessons learning um, theme in some of what I say. The main thing I wanted to do today is um, look at what we've learned across the spectrum of UN interventions beyond uh, beyond peacekeeping so that we can try and inform how to approach the future of peace operations. Um, and then I'll just put a couple of issues out on the table that might help inform um, our discussion. Um, I was really struck yesterday um, by Dr. Marty Natalagawa's presentation where he talked about how the local, the national, the regional and the global are now one. And he also talked about how politics, economics, social and cultural issues too are also now one. And I really think that's a theme that's coming through very clearly, particularly in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, at the high-level dialogue earlier this year on SDG 16 in particular, the SG said, investing in sustaining peace means in 
investing in basic services, bringing humanitarian and development agendas together, building more effective and accountable institutions, protecting human rights, promoting social cohesion and diversity, ensuring the meaningful participation of women and girls in all areas of society, and moving to sustainable energy. I mean, just that one statement, I think, lays out for us the enormity and the gravity of the task we have at hand, just on this one SDG and on this little area that we're, we're discussing today. Um, so sobering, I think. Um, in terms of all of these different um, initiatives that were going on in 2015 and 2016 in particular, um, as a secretariat official I was involved in, in all of them, some more than others, but it struck me at the time that there was a similar context for all of these reviews. Um, to, so to share a bit of that context, I think it was partly a frustration with, with our progress in each of these areas, a frustration too at the siloed efforts that we've made in these separate areas and a lack of collaboration across them. Um, a sense of pressure uh, from national governments and member states that they really needed to be showing that their, their aid and their donor assistance was having impact and effect, needed to be showing that to their taxpayers in particular. Um, and a need or a perceived need for a grand bargain around some of these issues, as though we haven't had grand bargains around them before. Um, and finally, really for us at the Secretariat, a real sense of pressure that we had to start getting things right because people were losing patience with our efforts. Pretty much, as Ian said, all of these efforts referenced each other and that really goes to, I think, their interconnectedness. So what I wanted to um, share with you today was looking at all of those different um, reviews and those processes, I wanted to draw out some of the trends that we might see coming from each of them that might provide a lens for how we decide how to move forward in the peacekeeping or the peace operations space. So here are some common themes um, across, those, across those reviews of the different ways we intervene. The first set I'm going to show you, I, I've kind of categorised as the principles uh, for engagement. So firstly, that development, human rights and peace and security are interlinked and they're also reliant on each other. I think that's a point that, that we sometimes miss. They're reliant on each other if we're to ensure sustainable peace and prosperity. We have to get better at working in partnership at different levels as well as in different configurations based on our comparative advantages and our mutual understanding and respect of each other's efforts. There's no excuse any longer for not joining the dots across different sectors and looking at how those sectors impact on each other. And really, we've been told very clearly that we need to work a lot smarter, both in terms of addressing problems before they escalate and in terms of divine, designing interventions that will last. A second group of issues I, I kind of found across these different reviews, uh, I would describe as focus areas, if you like. I think, I hope, there's established acceptance now that a human rights-based approach is key and it's crucial, and that we have to put people, as Jenny was saying, all people at the centre of our interventions. We were talking about women, peace and security and gender um, this morning and I think it might flow through all day, but I'm really hopeful that we've moved to the point where we're beyond talk now and we have a real genuine recognition that women's engagement and empowerment is essential for success of everything we're trying to do. I think youth came out strongly as a clear focus area, perhaps an area that we haven't paid enough attention to in the past, including looking at how um, disaffected youth um, what happens to disaffected youth can lead to um, future causes of conflict as well as traumas to the society in terms of how those youth grow up and, and adapt as adults. Climate change um, as a cause of natural disasters as well as climate change as a driver of conflict is something that they all mentioned as, as us needing to take into account. But of course, climate change is just hugely difficult for us as a factor to incorporate into our forward planning. It's so hard to know how it's going to impact and how it's going to play out, but it's there. I think we have a strong sense um, in the UN that we need to be moving away from imposing solutions. And Jenny referred to that as, as something we need to be doing too, listening to the needs on the ground and listening to, across a society um, to what people are desiring from us in terms of our support. And this is linked but not quite the same, um, this issue of building on and complementing local capacities. 
in this sense, we have to really be conscious of the challenges of not substituting capacity when we intervene, not causing any brain drain by taking the best people with us. And also there's a very tricky issue of how we support local salary sustainment um, after we're gone. The role of civil society and, and for us to learn that we have to operate beyond state-state um, state relations is something that's come out very clearly. Um, we need to be drawing on the comparative strengths of different parts of the society, including civil, um, civil society. And we've really seen that play out a lot in the multilateral space when it comes to protection of civilians as an issue, I think. And then lastly, these are um, trends that came out for me more in terms of structures and procedures. Um, so I think expectations are much higher on us now in this regard. Um, we have a much stronger need for more predictability. People want to know where we're going with things. We need a less templated approach um, and focus a lot on, on reliable and sustainable funding. Um, and obviously what came up very clearly is um, when we're going to intervene, we need much better information about what's happening on the ground. Often we haven't had the time to do that, but that's again where we need to work in partnership with others who do have a better sense of what's happening in a particular country context to inform what we're going to be doing. There's a lot more pressure on us in all of these reviews to be better at measuring what we're doing and showing the impact of, of what we're planning to do. And then lastly, um, this issue of countering violent extremism. Um, is becoming an emerging focus area for us, I think, across all of these streams. So there, you know, there's a lot for us to think about there in terms of how we plan and how we prepare for future missions. So now I just wanted to touch on some issues very briefly to give us some flavour for the discussion, what the future holds for UN peace operations. Um, as has already been said this morning, we're going to continue to be... Um, an organisation that's mandated to operate within a state context, but we're going to have to keep dealing with cross-border threats. Non-state armed groups in many of the contexts we're going to be um, involved in, um, violent extremism and so on. I guess I'm running out of time, so the one that I would, I would ask for input from people in the audience about is whether we think the Security Council is really going to start giving us more limited, um, uh, maybe more achievable mandates, or whether we're still going to be sent into environments with um, very ambitious mandates that may not meet expectations. It's a question in my mind. All of this to say that the reality of the situations we're deployed to are going to continue not to match our doctrine, our theory, our principles and our structures. And I guess in that sense I'm thinking about um, issues that again have been raised this morning. Should we deploy if there's no peace to keep? Um, what about non-use of force as we compare it to what we're supposed to do in terms of protecting civilians? And how do we manage this issue of, of consent when it's not full or it's not there at all? Lastly, I just wanted to touch on um, a couple of issues we might discuss about how we approach the future. We know, uh, some of us know, I think last week it was just announced the, the Secretary General's restructuring plan. Um, it's, it's one of maybe the most tangible reforms to come out of the high-level panel report. Um, there's a lot of good intention behind it and, and reasons for it, but I just would draw out a couple of challenges. I think the challenge for the Secretariat is going to be how to make sure that the process and the fallout of structural reform doesn't take over from those very good ideas that are underpinning the need for it. Some questions that jump into my mind are what happens to the Department of Field support in the context of this structural review? Um, what does it mean for support of our operations on the ground? Um, where have the cross-cutting mandates gone in this, in this merger structure that's existing right now? I'm thinking of protection of civilians as one example. And again, re returning to the gender issue, the way gender is treated in, in what we've seen so far, um, some might think comes across a little tokenistically and, and there needs to be a lot more meat on the bones and there actually is a lot more going on than, than the reform might suggest. Um, I'm not going to say anything on this because it's been touched on and I've run out of time, but the role of the Security Council is really key to this. And if peacekeeping operations are going to continue to be the elastic band that the Security Council pulls in any direction um, as is needed, um, then the Secretariat needs to be much better at giving frank and fearless advice to the Council and keeping the Council with us as we pursue uh, our missions. And lastly, the importance of knowledge management. Um, we do a good job of it in UN peacekeeping um, relative to a lot of other organisations and we need to keep supporting um, that effort. Um, and just the first session we had yesterday morning, um, what I wanted to say in terms of what can Australia contribute back to the UN, we saw two great presentations on the historical trajectory of all of the missions Australia's been involved in. 
how do we move beyond the history and, and how do we draw together the lessons of Australia's experience in peacekeeping and share that knowledge back with the UN? Friends of the UN will give it harsh advice about what it's getting right and what it's getting wrong. And I think that's a, a very tangible uh, contribution that Australia could make to supporting our efforts. So thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Leanne. Uh, it feels like a whirlwind tour with these these three uh, quick sessions. Uh, I now welcome uh, Dim, sorry, put my teeth back in, Jim Dello Giacomo, um, former Deputy Director, so former as in until very recently Deputy Director of the Centre in, on International Cooperation at New York University. Looking across his CV, he seems to have worked uh, for most of the significant uh, agencies and think tanks that I've ever heard of in this area. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your thoughts, Jim. Please welcome Jim. Thank you very much uh, to uh, the United Nations Association of Australia for bringing me here. Um, it's a, it's a, a great pleasure to participate in this conference for someone who, who feels uh, multilateral by uh, nature and uh, nurture. While it's very unfashionable to have multiple nationalities uh, in this town at the moment, uh, I do have four, uh, even though I was born in Sydney uh, in, uh, uh, and grew up in a, town, um, a suburb called the Lambie Heights, which means peaceful place. Uh, but I have spent uh, a large part of the last 30 years in, in areas of conflict. And it's, uh, it's there that I've, uh, I've cut across uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Ian, my first SRSG, uh, Mike Smith. Uh, uh, I uh, remember uh, compiling uh, uh, Untayet's uh, um, uh, contribution to the Brahimi report and, and many others. So it feels very, very much my home. And, uh, and also to see uh, Penny Wensley again uh, uh, from New York. Uh, so I, uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Nelson uh, uh, described a, a future exhibition coming here at the War Memorial uh, in uh, uh, about uh, people who uh, uh, don't carry weapons to work uh, or use them. Uh, and I think uh, I'm one of those. I've never worn a bloom beret, but I've been interacting with uh, or trying to interact with UN missions uh, for, for many years. Uh, you know, I first attempted to go and visit UNTAG in 1989 when I was working at the Australian and was refused a South African visa, so never it was successful, but ended up on Operation Lifeline in, in South, what is now South Sudan. Um, but uh, uh, I served in the Department of Political Affairs in New York during the, uh, uh, the Interfet referendum uh, as a political officer in UNTAED, and have uh, studied uh, uh, missions such as UNMIL in Liberia, the original work with UNMIS uh, doing some civic education, UNMIT, and, and so on. And so my departure point uh, uh, this morning is uh, looking at the, the theme of day two, which is strengthening Australia's support in uh, uh, UN peace operations. And I think Penny gave a great framing for, 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 for what I'm about to say. Because when looking at the topic of uh, our session about uh, uh, planning, preparing, and, and training for future challenges, uh, I, I did want to look at uh, what it means for Australia. And I do want to have a very uh, political take on that. Because uh, you know, David Horner talked about uh, the, the, the history, uh, the golden age of peacekeeping, but he sort of ended with this, you know, this. I think he used the figure of 59 Australian peacekeepers left, and including no police, as has been discussed. I think Lisa Charlin's uh, piece in Aspie on uh, uh, on uh, was it uh, Thursday it painted an even more dire picture of, of, of 32 personnel, and so I think we're at a we are at a sort of a, a crisis point. Um, you know, Mike, uh, in, in quoting uh, the, uh, the, the speech of uh, the Minusco uh, uh, peacekeeper, uh, you know, framed it very much as a domestic political issue, and I think uh, Penny picked up on that this, this morning as well. And uh, so I wanted to tr try and look at some of these, these issues um, uh, and, and sort of try to draw them back to uh, uh, some of the practicalities of peacekeeping operations. So how it, uh, taking this sort of the conversation from the Hill, which is behind us uh, all the way to, uh, to South Sudan and, 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 and Juba. I think, uh, the, so the five points I want to look at is that, that you know, we, we live in a very uncertain world and I think we, in, in, in my lifetime, uh, uh, I don't think Australia has been really ready to always predict when and where it will need the United Nations. 
I think I want to underline the importance of the organization's legitimacy uh, in peace and security and how that is important to Australia's national interests. I want to uh, you know, then um, look at um, um, some of the, the issues re regarding uh, managing risk, uh, perceptions of risk and caveats and how that all comes down to uh, uh, operational uh, issues. So the first point, uh, you know, we, we aren't very present. Well, we may be, but often uh, um, our political leaders are, are less so. And um, uh, I, I recognize that not all uh, uh, our elected representatives might be so. But I think there is a, um, uh, a, a real challenge in uh, trying to sort of meld the, the information that's out there, um, the analysis is done by uh, a, a agencies uh, with the, the political realities of the day. Um, you know, I, I've had a number of conversations in Canberra with all many of my old contacts who are, are thinking five or ten years out. Um, but we know uh, uh, up on the hill that's, that that sort of timeline is, is, uh, is much shorter. And uh, I think, um, you know, trying to make an argument, uh, a political argument in the domestic political sphere, which addresses the question that Matthew just put up, about the value of the UN, uh, the value of UN peace operations, and uh, uh, the value of UN political operations, uh, uh, characterizing it as uh, insurance and, and using many of the, the, the same arguments that we, we can't predict what's coming around the corner, and we don't often do a good job of preparing for it. Uh, in that regard, uh, you know, I, I, I pulled off the shelf uh, uh, the book by Don Greenlees and uh, 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 Rob Garand, uh, Deliverance about the history of East Timor uh, and the Australian intervention. And I think, you know, there was, uh, things moved very rapidly, um, you know, I think uh, uh, in 1999. And I, I, I sort of, there needs to be a case made based on the history that is our living history. Uh, not for foreign policy in Australia not to be too transactional and too short-sighted. Because uh, when something goes wrong, uh, uh, who, who, are, who are we going to call? You know, we, uh, we don't, uh, in Australia, have the power to act unilaterally. Uh, we do need to, as I think Penny mentioned and others, we do need to work in alliances, and those alliances are very important. And you know, uh, the case for multilateralism is really building those alliances and building those relationships that can, can be called in a, at a later stage. Um, you know, I think in, in, in 1999, uh, there was a lot of, uh, um, uh, um, there, there were relationships with the militaries that were called in, but also, you know, I think uh, going back to some of the, the diplomacy that was done, uh, it was very important to have these, these, these mechanisms and to have these fora. Um, and um, you know, I think in that regard, to pick up some of the comments that uh, uh, Dr. Natalagawa made, uh, you know, there is a case that there are regional organizations, and I know that it does come up, but uh, having lived in, uh, in ASEAN countries and worked and studied ASEAN's actions, including on the, the recent Thai-Cambodia border war, uh, I, I think there is a real dearth of institutions that Australia can turn to um, and uh, to, to recognize that. You know, uh, we have a crisis uh, on the border of uh, Myanmar and, and Bangladesh right now, and the, 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 the UN agencies are on the front line, um, whether the UN politically, uh, the political peace uh, security architecture can get in there is a different question. But I, I think, uh, you know, realizing and uh, recognizing and underlining uh, the importance of the UN as uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, the first responders uh, is, is an important case to make. Um, because I, I think in my third point that, and going back to 1999 again, that uh, there is a, a power, uh, a very a strength uh, in working through the, the international bodies. Um, you know, uh, Australia, um, Australia's actions in 1999 would have been very different if they had been unilateral. And we've seen the sort of the consequences of unilateral action. And uh, I think, uh, you know, you look at uh, uh, Resolution 1264, uh, the Interfet Resolution and the Security Council. And, uh, you know, without sort of giving too much away, uh, there was a real hesitance uh, in my recollection uh, of Australia to go unilaterally. They wanted that cover. It's important for legal reasons for our, our troops. Uh, it's important uh, to get the legitimacy of the operation internationally. It's important to build our alliances and allies around that. 
And I think I just want to sort of take a little bit of a divergence there to, to underline a, 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 a something I've, I've talked about uh, on a number of occasions. But, you know, we did dedicate the, uh, the, the peacekeeping memorial on, on Thursday. And I think when we talk about peacekeeping, it is often the Blue Berets. But the, you know, when you look at uh, um, the, the number of, uh, you know, uh, actual sort of kinetic activities, firefights, uh, shooting that went on in, in, in the East Timor peace operation, it was very small. But if you look at the politics that went around it, it was, it was very strong. And I think, you know, while we had a Chapter 7 mission, which was a robust mission, the politics that went on around uh, Interfet, around uh, UNTET, uh, the pressure that was applied internationally, uh, the alliances that were, 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 were sheltered were, 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 were very robust. And, you know, the success of that mission... Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, relied upon that diplomacy. Uh, I've also argued that it relied a little bit on the, the course that history was taking with Indonesia at that time. Uh, but I think uh, that's uh, something to, to, to recognize that uh, the ability to build those alliances, to build that legitimacy, uh, comes uh, through the United Nations and through multilateralism. And I think we need to remember that history, that, uh, and remember it correctly, that you know, our Australian troops played a very important part, um, but uh, so did Australian diplomats. Uh, and so we... We need to prepare for the day when, when we need uh, UN peace operations uh, um, now. And, um, uh, you know, I, I could see many scenarios, and I, I, I don't want to, to name names, but I think that, you know, we're, we don't live in a particularly stable region. There is a lot of uh, 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 concerns and a lot of cases where uh, uh, we uh, Australian uh, uh, forces may need to deploy ab abroad, uh, and but it will be... Uh, a stronger operation, uh, a better operation, if it's done sort of multilaterally. And uh, the UN is one option. It's not the only option. But I think uh, to, to make that case. And so preparing uh, is, is, is a political issue, preparing. Um, um, and uh, it's also, uh, as I think Dan said, some of the um, uh, uh, military issues. So I'm, I'm just uh, getting my wind-up call, but to, uh, to pick up some of the points that, you know, I think in, in managing the risk, uh, we need to uh, uh, recognise that there are domestic concerns, there are concerns about uh, the harm's way, the harm that could come to our, our troops, uh, and there are ways of uh, uh, managing that by providing, uh, uh, at a very sort of detailed level, uh, better services uh, in terms of medical evacuation, and I think we had a, a couple of examples of that on the first day from uh, Bruce Armstrong. But I think trying to sort of think about uh, building the political case, uh, uh, recognising that Australians are going to be put in harm's way and there needs to be some protection, I think making that sort of uh, package is a, is a delicate balance. But I'll leave that there and I'd be happy to take up any uh, uh, points uh, in the, the next session. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Jim. And uh, while the other two panellists are coming up, I will just say I, I think the uh, it should be the new motto of the United Nations Association: uh, when something goes wrong, who are you going to call? You know, with appropriate Ghostbusters music in the background. <laughs> uh, so, thank you. Uh, it could be working now. Uh, do we have any questions in the audience? We usually do, and we'll have the usual uh, microphones. Uh, roaming, we have one. In, one. We'll go to this one in the front first, and then gentlemen further up the back. And if you could just uh, wouldn't mind, and then over here, uh, if you wouldn't mind just um, saying who you who you're with or from. Hi, my name is Samantha Willis, and I'm an A and E student. Um, my question is to Leanne Smith. You talked about when talking about future uh, approaching future challenges. You talked about the youth, and it has been shown that using and accepting intergenerational shifts in groups can actually increase the efficiency and effectiveness of a group. Um, do you think that eradicating segregation such as the United Nations and then United Nations youth could actually increase the or improve the United Nations? And in saying that, uh, um, listening to youth voices can actually uh, get rid of the fear of change in older generations such as seeing women in power and seeing strong, intelligent women could possibly improve that feminist uh, wave. 
Thank you for that wonderful question. Um, look, I think the points you're making are as relevant domestically here right now as they are internationally. If we think about the marriage equality debate um, at the Whitlam Institute, we've been talking to a lot of young people who um, really feel like they're, they're the people who are going to have to live with the outcomes of these decisions, but they have no ability to input in it. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, from a, the Australian context into some of the peacekeeping context where we work, we haven't had much of a focus um, just because of a range of other priorities and finding that youth voice um, has not always been easy in, in conflict situations as well. Um, I'm not sure about the distinction you're talking about between um, UN youth and the UN more broadly. It's not an area that I know that much about. I don't know if any other panellists do. Um, but certainly finding opportunity. I don't think I've ever seen, in the time I was at headquarters, I don't think I've ever seen a child um, in a security council debate or discussion. I don't know if anybody else here has. but. Uh, the youth voice could certainly be more prominent in, in the policy and political side of what we do. So there was a uh, uh, one up the back. Yes, um, that's it. And then down here and then over here. Uh, yeah, I guess my question would probably be for Jim Della Giacoma, if I've pronounced that correctly. Um, yeah, I, I sort of... Uh, wanted to pick up on your point of legitimacy and um, taking uh, alliance politics to the um, international uh, arena through global organisations. I guess um, sort of notable comments from across the political spectrum in Australia, people like Bob Carr and Malcolm Fraser have kind of drawn attention to concerns surrounding... Um, I guess, I guess foreign um, or alliance politics influence over Australian foreign policy. Um, and, and looking at the work of, um, I guess, uh, John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt, um, in terms of uh, lobbying on foreign policy in the US um, after, after September the 11th as well and some of the concerns that were raised there, I guess it just made me think, you know, what what kind of protections could the UNAA set in place to avoid um, in, in flaring some of those tensions and concerns that that Carr, Fraser, Mearsheimer, Walt, and the likes have raised, and um, you know, perhaps some sort of scheme of transparency where people in the UNAA declare any um, relationships with foreign governments or any funding relationships with foreign governments? Do you think measures like that could be put in place to ensure a balanced perspective is maintained? Uh, I must admit that I, I live uh, on the other side of the world, so I'm not familiar with some of these more recent debates, uh, uh, and particularly Bob Carr and Malcolm Fraser's comments. But uh, I, I think, uh, as, a, as a general point, my, my argument would be uh, that uh, uh, more uh, um, multilateral alliances and, 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 and less bilateral alliances uh, is a good thing. Uh, that's the sort of uh, the argument I'm making that the, the UN, um, uh, by uh, working with others on collective action, I think there's a higher level of uh, legitimacy. Uh, I think we are still dealing with some of the consequences of the, uh, the, the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and uh, uh, the, the US uh, um, uh, unilateral uh, uh, engage engagement and Australia's support of that. Uh, so I, I, I think that there are there are contingencies, and uh, we could uh, talk a lot about them. But I think that uh, working together with others through a UN framework has a higher level of legitimacy than than uh, that, that. That's the argument I'm making. Uh, in terms of what uh, UNAA could do itself, uh, you know, I think transparency is a good thing. Um, I'm not a member, and I, I don't know your your rules and regulations. But I think. Uh, uh, you know, I think having uh, the transparency of uh, debates if anyone is uh, receiving foreign funding or working for foreign organizations, I think that's, uh, that I would expect that to be a natural part of an internal discussion. Do either of you wish to comment on that one? Okay. Uh, gentleman here in the second row back is, is next. Yes, I th actually, um, 
Jenny just made the, the suggestion we might take uh, a couple of, of questions. So uh, we'll hear from you in a second. And I think there was a gentleman here uh, in the uh, about the fifth row back in the centre. We'll go next. So, John Hegarty, World Citizen Association Australia. Uh, I'd like to link part of last session with this one. I was very excited to find that the Institute for Economics and Peace, through Steve and co, have a significantly reliable measure of peace. So is it possible that we'll now be scientific in our investigations for peace? We try something, put a hypothesis, more money, more troops, more peacekeeping, more education, and then see what happens so it becomes scientific. World history and scientific history shows that once you can measure something, whether it's time or distance, has led to huge advances. Perhaps this could. Thanks. And uh, a second question there. Uh, my name's Cosmos. Um, I'm just curious, uh, with all the various issues and challenges that peacekeeping has and some of the uh, proposed ways forward, is there a different layer at all that um, comes in as to whether, for example, NATO provides the peacekeeping. I know the United Nations has used NATO on occasions. NATO has done it on itself on occasion as well. Um, I think maybe the Peace Corps has had, had involvement in the past as well. Does that look, change things? Is this all coordinated? Is there an, a different story depending on who's doing it? Um, does that raise challenges? Who'd like to tackle those two? Let me take the first one. Um, so there is a there is a bunch of, uh, of research of the the kind that you're talking about um, by political scientists and of you and peacekeeping, for instance, it shows that peacekeeping works. Um, and not only does it work, that it works in the hardest cases. So peacekeepers get sent to the hardest cases. It doesn't just work because they're sent to easy cases. Uh, so there, there is a range of research that's doing the kind of analysis that you're asking for. Um, and so I, I think we have the evidence. In terms of more micro-level uh, testing of what works, you run into real difficulties about um, the difference of contexts and the difference of situations any time you're trying to do that, that kind of analysis. Uh, so I'm less optimistic about that. But in terms of the, the macro level, um, certainly we have the evidence. I might try on, on both of the questions if I can. Um, uh, I, I think that those numbers are just fascinating. I think for a lot of us who've served in the field, they feel a little bit far away from, from what you experience on the ground. And I'd also say that um, measurement is not always very political. And if there's one thing we've, we know about the Security Council, um, is that politics do come first. And I, the example I would give is um, for quite a while, we were trying to do more measurement on when the right time is for a peacekeeping mission to leave, part of our transition policy. So we were looking at how, what kind of indicators and what kind of benchmarks we could use to be able to say that a country has moved from, from A to, to L on rule of law or, or on any particular issue. Um, and we started investing quite a lot in it. And what we found when we tried to provide those updated reports on progress, for example, which were more measurable, um, th there wasn't a lot of interest because there are other motivators um, for why member states of the Security Council think we should stay or leave a place and, and numbers can be quite problematic in that regard. <laughs> um, and on, on the second question, which is a really good one, thank you, um, I, mean, I think one of the key elements of the HIPPO report was about partnership, um, a recognition that the UN is not always the best placed um, to intervene, a recognition that other partners, regional organisations like you mentioned NATO, but there's also the African Union, of course, and the sub-regional bodies in Africa, the European Union as well, have different strengths, different regional interests, different national interests of their member state groupings. Um, so we are learning to work much more in partnership with other organisations, particularly regional ones. The only thing I would say maybe as a UN person is that um, there will always be a need for UN interventions in p some particular context, and that's got a lot to do with the legitimacy and the universality of the UN as an organisation, um, and f where, how, how well we're doing against it or not, the principles of peacekeeping that we apply, particularly around impartiality. So, uh, you know, if you think of a context where a regional solution might involve a neighbour who has a stake in the conflict that's going on next door, there are, there's an example of a case where a bit more arm's length distance um, can be very valuable. 
Uh, just to uh, add uh, to the first question, you know, uh, I think uh, you know, there is uh, a, a great uh, um, uh, reluctance among many member states to, uh, to, to, to have a peacekeeping operation to, to let the UN in. And this is one of the, the, the legacies of East Timor, for example, when uh, talking with the Thai military about uh, the situation in uh, southern Thailand, their objective is to never let the UN in because what they learned from East Timor is that you let the UN in and you get a referendum and the territory breaks away. Uh, so I think any any uh, uh, willingness or uh, among member states to allow uh, the uh, the UN to experiment uh, to do some tests, I think, will be uh, almost non-existent. So I I don't see that. But I think there is. Post facto, uh, probably a lot we can do with the indexes like the one that Steve described or studies that, the, uh, as, as Jenny described, to, to learn from uh, uh, what's been done. But I think uh, there's, uh, I don't think, any appetite for the experimentation to, to try and get ahead of the curve because, as I, I think uh, Leanne said, the, the Security Council and the, the, the body itself is, a, is just a, too political and it's not in the national self-interest to, to allow that. We have an absolute forest of hands. Uh, so could we, uh, this gentleman in the f uh, first, we'll take several. Uh, uh, microphone here and also uh, just just second row next to Harold. And who's the second question? We'll go up the back a bit and could I, uh, sorry? I, um, I was going to go up the back uh, to the lady um, just about where I'm pointing. Uh, can you wait? Yes, put your, that's it. Blue jacket by the by the sound of it, by the look of it. Sorry, <laughs> it's very hard to see with the uh, the lights uh, shining in my eyes. So, uh, sir. Uh, ben Waltman, I actually just wanted to follow on um, from the question that Samantha had about the, I guess, various factions. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't. I'm the national um, partnership lead for UNAA Young Professionals, and I just wanted to follow on from the question that Samantha had about the different factions of um, the UN and potentially breaking down those silos or segregations between them in order to reach, I guess, better outcomes for the United Nations. Um, and I guess one of the challenges that I think the UN has is its broad uh, scope, probably its main challenge is that we have such a broad scope that we're responsible for. And to touch on what um, I think uh, Jenny was saying earlier in her presentation was that in terms of when we were peacekeeping, um, it's about setting realistic goals. And I think one of the challenges that we're often faced with, um, in, even in Australia, is we're dealing with so many concepts and so many things that we're trying to, I guess, um, uh, benefit or try to contribute to, that breaking it down into the various groups, we think, is um, possibly a way for these, um, I guess, seg or not segregations, but these factions to focus on what's important to them. And I was talking with Matthew Kronberg earlier to say, if we've got all of these different factions and we're working towards the same thing, what we really need to be, I guess, concentrating on is how, yes, we have different things that are important to each of our groups, but how we actually come together and share those opinions so that we're coming together with a cohesive response to these, um, I guess, areas that we're working in. I don't know, Leanne, if, um, if oh, sorry, Jenny, if you wanted to respond to that, I guess, following, if that's similar to what you were saying with the peacekeeping. I'll just take that second question <clears throat> and then come back to those those comments. Uh, yeah. Hi, hello. I'm Jane and from the ANU a student as well. Um, so we've heard a lot about the protection of civilian, civilians and the protection of human rights. And I'm just wondering how, how do we promote these human rights, which in itself is quite a Western-based um, doctrine, without with while engaging the, the local community without having this kind of protectionist and paternalist approach and point of view and could this paternalism be contributing to the lack of trust that lots of groups and states have in international bodies like the UN thanks yes um, so I'm still not entirely sure it, it sounds like that's a that's a, a conversation about UNAA. Is that what you mean? UNAA is yeah. The UN, the UN women, UN youth. Right. 
Okay, so we're talking about a you know a microcosm of the problem of fragmentation and silos that happens at the at the international level, and I think if that's what we're talking about as a problem internationally, then ab absolutely it should be addressed in the at the national level. So I think that's a really important conversation that uh, that should be going on. And if you you feel like there there's too much fragmentation, then this is a great forum to raise it in, and and, and I hope the others in the room are listening, um, and and to to briefly talk about. Um, protection and, and human rights, you know, and I'm sure uh, Leanne will have more to say about this as well. Thinking really carefully about assumptions, both at, in the design and then I imagine not having been a peacekeeper myself, but try uh, m m being mindful about assumptions that you bring into the implementation of your mandate seems to be, to be really Im important. Um, the reality, I would guess, is much more often that the, the obstruction of protection of civilians and the rejection of things like promoting human rights comes from places other than um, vulnerable individuals that might be the intended beneficiaries of it. Uh, but finding ways of putting those experiences at the core of the design and of peacekeeping and the design of policy um, has been recognised for a long time as being one of the crucial parts of doing peacekeeping better. And I think, as in most policy-making contexts, closing that gap between where policy-making happens and where it's actually realised on the ground is a difficult one. But I imagine you have... Yeah, thanks for asking that question. It's a topic close to my heart. Um, I, I wanted to be a, a do human rights in a peacekeeping context for me because that's where the rubber hits the road on these lofty principles um, and to see how they were applied. I wanted to share a quick story. My, my first experience abroad was um, working as a volunteer in Indonesia and, and I, I was working on human rights issues and I remember saying to one of my Indonesian colleagues um, early in the piece, oh, you know, I don't want to be too... I don't want to push these, these Western concepts on you. I understand the cultural relativism arguments and so on and I don't want to push, push my perspective. And I remember this colleague, a young woman, grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me, and I won't use the expletive she used, but she said, these are my rights as much as they're yours. Don't you dare tell me that you own them and I don't. And it was a big wake-up call for me very early, very early on. Another example I wanted to give you was doing human rights work in Afghanistan. I think really the, the biggest lesson I learned was it's really about listening, listening and listening and listening. Um, we had one experience that we were working on transitional justice um, a national transitional justice strategy and in all of that cultural context of what's going on in Afghanistan and relations between men and women, we somehow managed to arrange a round table in a very small community where sat around the table were young women who'd been victims um, of violence and sexual violence, current mayors, former commanders, um, mayors, uh, former commanders who are now mayors, human rights violators, all sitting around the table. And part of our role as the UN and UN, UN human rights people was to facilitate that discussion. And so when I got to watch this young woman stand up and look at the perpetrator of the per, her perpetrator in the eye and explain how she felt and what she was looking for and what justice meant to her. That was a real example to me of the power of, um, of human rights dialogue uh, to move things forward. Um, just to underline a point that um, as part of my work, I've worked in, in, in villages in, in, in Latin America, Africa, uh, Asia, Europe, uh, or, um, you know, in, in Afghanistan, Liberia, South Sudan, and I've never heard uh, an argument uh, uh, that uh, at that level uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the, the the, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the basic human rights are not universal. Where you hear it is when you're meeting the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister, you're going to the Foreign Ministry, uh, where you're, you're hearing at the UN, you're hearing at the argument to explain why uh, those, uh, uh, the rights of their citizens back in the country are being violated. It's a, an argument. But I think if you're you know, at the village level, you, I think, uh, and uh, having done a lot of public opinion research in, in, in villages, people understand that and they know their rights are being violated and uh, you know uh, they're, they're, they're trying to stop that and I think one of the 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 issues I've just been recently writing about with countering violent extremism is 
uh, is, is stopping the overreach and the excessive, uh, um, uh, the use of the state of the idea of countering violent extremism uh, to violate human rights and to, to, uh, to uh, use excessive force and, and so on. So I, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, I just wanted to underline that, that I, I don't think that's a problem uh, in terms of universality, but I do think it is an argument that it's used to, to, to explain away why rights are being violated. Thank you. Now we have <coughs> uh, a question here, and Jeremy uh, next, and then we'll take uh, the lady up the back, and then we'll move across the room. So, uh, yes, my name's Tim Ford, uh, previous uh, military advisor. I'm, I want to move to training for future challenges, which is on the heading up there, and we haven't really talked about it at all. Um, I identified certainly when I was military advisor, and I know Patrick's talked about it today, the complete lack of training, the lack of preparation that we're finding in many areas in the UN uh, as you get into a mission area, both from the, from the contingents but also from uh, the leaders. And we know we've introduced a senior mission leadership course. We know there's an organisation called UNITAR. We know there are regional peacekeeping training centres and country training centres, and yet we're still not meeting the requirement. We're not getting prepared troops that are coming and uh, prepared police and prepared civilians. So what can we do about training for future challenges? Jeremy. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, so my, I was really quite taken, Jenny, by your idea of this crisis innovation cycle. And so I guess a question I've got for all three of you is, what do you see as the most important sites of innovation uh, in this field? And what might be done to improve the capacity of those sites to make good decisions about how best to innovate. Training, innovation, and uh, the lady up the back for the third question. Uh, Lisa Shallon from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, thank you for the presentations. For a moment I was taken back there for a, to a lunchtime session at IPI in New York, I think, having these discussions here in Canberra. Um, but my question was around the issue of performance. Um, in particular, I think if you go back five years ago, um, there were arguments that it was difficult for the UN or DPKO to make hard decisions to repatriate units because there wasn't enough of a supply of peacekeepers putting up their hands that were willing to engage. We've seen concerted efforts over the last few years through ministerial summits, the peacekeeping capability readiness system and, and other you know, approaches to improve that base of contributors. So my question is, do you think that we've hit a tipping point in terms of having enough of a supply of countries that are willing to contribute personnel that the tough decisions can be made around performance? All right, training, innovation and performance. It's um, a, a comprehensive list of questions. Um, Tim, I'm not, the, I'm not a training expert. In my previous capacity, I sat alongside the training um, team, Integrated Training Service, many of you may know, sits within, um, within DPKO. Um, I think last time I checked in, the focus of the Integrated Training Service in DPKO was to developing moving to developing the standards and looking for partners to, to do the delivery. And as you know, a lot, of, a lot of back and forth conversations between member states, particularly TCCs and PCCs, about how those packages are received and support to the national training institutes for the delivery of, of that training. But there are, there are multiple challenges. We, we still don't know who is being trained in some of these contexts. We don't know if the people who receive the training are being deployed. Um, with the turnover of deployments, um, some of that training's getting lost. And if I can s say something a bit outrageous, I'm not always sure that training is the answer to better operational um, performance on the ground. If you think about um, issues like sexual exploitation and abuse, I think training can only go so far. Another challenge we have is once you get into the mission envi environment, what training is available um, once you get there, because obviously, training in an abstract concept back in your, your training institute is very different to when you hit the ground in a place like CAR or, or Mali. Um, and we don't do a good enough job of training in the mission environment because everybody's too busy getting on with the job. Um, on, on Jeremy, on your question about innovation, um, I think the, site, the best sites for innovation in peacekeeping, not surprisingly from where I sit, is in around the lessons learning and best practice um, aspect of what we do. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, most peacekeeping missions have a, a best practice officer in, in, in ideal situations, more than one person, whose job it is to 
draw on experiences happening in the mission, the good and the bad and the ugly, feeding those experiences um, horizontally to other best practice officers in different missions. So they're reaching out to each other to compare how have you done this in your mission, how could we do it here, and feeding it back up um, as part of our virtual cycle of learning so that we can do policy reform based on actual lessons on the ground. So I think that's one of the, one of the places where we could focus more effort uh, for innovation. And Lisa, on your, your question around performance, um, I, would be, um, I would be nervous to say that we've reached the point where we can afford to be very strong on um, repatriating uh, troops for, for performance issues. That doesn't mean I don't think we should do it. I just think we're never going to get to a comfortable place, I don't think, in terms of known quantities and capacities and assets for peacekeeping is always going to be a problem. But I think the answer is that we have to be brave and make those decisions about performance um, regardless. Of course, the keeping in mind that those brave decisions have serious implications on the ground, particularly when we have a protection of civilians mandate. Thanks. Um, briefly address all three. Uh, I've only got one comment to add on training because, uh, you know, I, I think um, really Tim, you need to be up here telling us <laughs> what to do. I think it, it, it sits very much more with you. But, um, but as an educator, I would think outside the, the peacekeeping training and the military training in particular, um, that what's important is, is ways to think, not just training in what to do, and particularly in the unpredictable context of peacekeeping. Um, so I, you know, I wonder if there's a gap there about uh, ways of thinking and mindsets, you know, mindsets were, were mentioned earlier, ways of thinking rather than um, uh, kind of doctrinal ways of responding. That would be one of the gaps to me. In terms of sites of innovation, uh, I guess um, where I think we've seen innovation most likely to happen is at uh, the, you know, is in the Security Council and its um, member states and its interlocutors with you know particular ideas which maybe come from the secretariat maybe they come from elsewhere about the particular design of, of missions at points of time they're like they're windows of opportunity into which step um, proactive activist uh, diplomatic initiatives um, certainly if we look at you know 1956 and the the invention of what we understand that traditional peacekeeping to, to be that's where it's at that's an unusual place for innovation to sit if you think outside the UN. So where ought it to sit? Where does innovation usually come from? It usually comes much more from, from a dynamic and organic place, you know, closer to the ground. Uh, but it, innovation also needs um, a much greater tolerance for risk. And there are really good reasons in the UN more broadly and in peacekeeping in particular to be risk averse because we're talking, you know, the risk of failure is, is uh, l quite literally life or death. So it's a really difficult space for that innovation to happen, but I expect there are more opportunities for that if we can move some of the, uh, the stricter bureaucratic controls on implementation away. I suspect that there's much more potential for innovation to be coming from the ground up and probably then, you know, captured um, uh, and dealt with in, a, in an even better way that, uh, by best practices, you know, and perhaps more than the one, you know, the one, the one solitary analyst. You know, I think that's really crucial. Um, and to Lisa's point, uh, so I just, I just wrote this report on Resolution 2272, Security Council resolution that um, was to address sexual exploitation and abuse. One of, really the main headline of which was endorsing the Secretary General's um, authority to repatriate an entire national contingent if there's credible evidence of um, system, systemic or widespread abuse by that contingent. So uh, it, it doesn't need to be every member of a contingent having uh, been alleged to, to perpetrate abuse. Um, and when I was writing that report, one of my questions was how feasible is this actually given what we know about the undersupply of peacekeeping and, you know, can we ever really send a large national contingent home? We, can the Secretary General ever really do that? And I was quite surprised by the responses that I got back, which was actually these numbers is not what matters. So my sense of other people's thinking, if I can report that, was that, yeah, I, I think there is a sense of some kind of tipping point. But I imagine we might see a bit more on that in Vancouver in November. But the same has been done, too. It, it has been done. The repatriation has been done, of course. Yeah, it, of course, you know, the, the Republic of... Yeah, absolutely. 
of the exactly. whole unit, after 10 days being deployed, had already organized a prostitution ring. Yeah. The SRG sent them out. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the ambassadors were screaming. Yeah. The SRG said, out, out, out. And they went. Yeah. 2005. Yeah. Already. Let's move to uh, to the next batch of questions. I'd like to. I've been neglecting the back right hand corner, so I'll, sir, I'll start with. And Lisa, I'm sorry, I didn't recognise you before. <laughs> sir, um, you first question, and then we'll take uh, a couple more uh, just in that quarter. Uh, thank you, Michael Bliss, uh, Department and of right Foreign, up the back, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and. Uh, formerly part of uh, Australia's Security Council team 2013-14. Um, uh, given the title and, and looking at uh, future challenges, um, I just wanted to make um, perhaps a little announcement for those who may not have seen it on Twitter, which is relevant um, to, I think, the conference as a whole, but also this session. And that is, um, and I've just received an email from Gillian Bird, our ambassador in New York overnight, um, confirming this, that uh, Australia and Ghana's initiative to get responsibility to protect and prevention onto the General Assembly agenda for the first time uh, ever uh, succeeded with an overwhelming vote in the General Assembly of 113 uh, in favour, uh, 21 against and 17 abstentions. Uh, so I'd just like to inject that into the conference and the conversation um, for those who've been asking about what more can we do at the New York end, and uh, for those who are non-multilateralists, I'll recognise that getting something onto an agenda doesn't sound like much, um, but um, for those who have been through UN processes, uh, they might recognise uh, the utility and the value of this, and so hopefully um, much of the conversation that we've been having here um, we'll be able to use in a prevention um, and R2P sense as well um, in the so, sort of general effort to uh, combat uh, mass atrocity. Thanks. There was another one. Yes, just there. Um, Barbara, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Barbara Dwyer from the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Um, I, this was a question I actually wanted to ask in the previous session, but it's probably even more relevant in this one because it's really about future thinking and innovation. Um, the, the, there's Security Council Resolution 1325 came into being in 2000, so it's 17 years now since we've had a resolution on women, peace and security. There's now nine Resol Security Council resolutions that make up the women, peace and security agenda. There's something like 70 countries have got national action plans on women, peace and security. But it all seems to be the same old, same old, same. Nothing, nothing seems to be moving forward. And what happens in peacekeeping missions is only going to be part of that much broader spectrum of the women, peace and security agenda. So I really just wanted to know what sort of thinking was going on, if any at all, um, within, particularly within the Security Council. But not just, I mean, is it happening more often than just once a year on the, in October on the anniversary of 1325? What's, what sort of things are happening that will really take forward the whole um, aspect of women's participation in peace processes? And we've, um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so we'll leave the questions there. I'm sorry, we're um, out of time and I'll invite uh, quick responses from the panel. Um, thanks, Barbara, for that question. Um, <laughs> I think that um, the debate in the Security Council around Resolution 2242 was um, a relative breath of fresh air. I think the sense that, that we in the Secretariat got from the Security Council members was that enough talk, it's time to, it's time to walk the walk. And if we don't take that opportunity now, where there was quite a lot of political support, probably because of the global study and everything that went with it, if we don't take the opportunity to push ahead and show results on this agenda, we could lose the momentum for a long time, I think. There's a lot going on, though, and I, I've, you probably already know about it, but DPKO, for example, has a forward-looking gender strategy, a four-year plan. And a lot of what was captured in the high-level panel report a lot of what's happening now came out of the good work that was already underway. What 2242 allowed us to do, though, was um, focus on the core areas of leadership and accountability, I think. And so even for us inside DPKO, we, we had a tag to start um, 
asking our senior management to make decisions on things. So, for example, um, the both USGs established um, raised the level of the senior gender advisor, and we see that raise the that level raising in our missions as well. Putting the senior gender advisor in the leadership team, both on the ground in the missions and at headquarters, so that it's not the enclave of gender over in the corner that everybody rolls their eyes at, but it's in the cut and thrust of the politics of everything else going on. From from my perspective, leading the women, peace and security team, there's a responsibility on gender advisors' side as well to to um, this might be a little controversial, but to be less um, uh, pure about what they're doing, to be more um, outward looking and reaching out to looking for partnership and explaining the nature of the work they do. Don't make, let's not make it so specialised that no one else can understand it. And maybe more importantly, show the value of taking a gender lens to a conflict analysis and show the value that it, it can have for other members of the team who may be focused on SSR or on, on something something else. So we have to really um, pump up the volume, if you like, and show show real results and, and, and show why it's important. So the, those initiatives are underway and if there's something that UNAA might do here, it's I would say... Um, and I guess I can say that now, hold, hold the UN's feet to the fire on the commitments that we've made and, and seek progress reports and updates on, on how those particular things are going. Jim, very briefly. Uh, just very briefly, I, 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 in defence of multilateralism, you know, getting something on the agenda is important, keeping it there is important, and I, I'm looking down at uh, the ambassador uh, from Timor-Leste, uh, Janelle, and if uh, uh, Jose ramos Horta was here, keeping Timor on the agenda for 27 years was a key part of eventually resolving the question of East Timor, as it used to be called. So I think uh, it, uh, these little steps are important. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for your stream of fabulous questions and apo apologies to those uh, I, I didn't manage to get to. Please join me now in uh, thanking our three speakers for their speeches. <laughs>